Is there a part of you that no one knows? Something that you're working on bringing out? Have you ever had to reinvent yourself in your professional life? A hard pivot of sorts. Well, today's guest is one of the most decorated linebackers of our time. And he's with me today. And he's going to share a little bit of insight of the courage, the vision, the grit it took to make that hard pivot after his retirement from the NFL and pursue his dream of becoming a filmmaker. Welcome to At The Podium. Welcome to At The Podium. Today, I hey, I mentioned it earlier. I love watching these high-performance athletes go from the field back to some of their wildest childhood dreams and define what the next chapter in their life is. And I'm so excited to be here with my friend Lamar Woodley. As most of you, especially in Michigan, know, hailing from Saginaw, Michigan, top three linebacker in the country, goes to University of Michigan. Hey, no surprise. Look at his shirt. He made sure he reminded me today. Goes to University of Michigan, accolade after accolade after accolade, top 50 draft pick, number 46 in the 07 draft to my second favorite team, the Pittsburgh Steelers. I'm here with Lamar, who's now the CEO of Area 56 Entertainment. And, And my man's making films. He's doing media. He's putting all kinds of shows and movies out. Lamar, man, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me on. That was that was actually a great intro. I appreciate that. Because <laughs> sometimes I actually forget, like, when you look back at your career and you look back and like, damn, I was the number three linebacker. I was number two linebacker in the country. And then coming to Michigan, getting all those awards, getting drafted to my favorite team, which was the Pittsburgh Steelers. So it worked out great for me going there, winning the Super Bowl. So that's it. Just hearing those things is always a great reminder sometimes. Yeah, I love yeah. it. And wait, so... Growing up in Michigan, though, I didn't know the Steelers were your favorite team. Yeah, they were my favorite team because um, it started when I was in middle school. So when I was in middle school, I uh, moved to the fullback position, you know, because I realized if you go back and you play fullback, you're running a ball, you know, girls call your name a little bit when you score a touchdown. <laughs> and when I was on defense, they didn't, nobody recognized me on defense. And I was ball- the same way I balled out in high school and college and the pros. It's the same thing I did in middle school, but they didn't recognize Sacks then. You get what I'm saying? So you yeah. had to run the ball. So I moved back to fullback, and uh, Jerome Bettis, who was number 36, I called myself like the bus because I was I was big like I yeah. am. I was like, I probably was about 200 pounds in the eighth grade. Um, oh, my goodness. I called goodness. myself the bus, and that's when I just became a Steelers fan ever since then. Uh, <laughs> 200 pounds. 200 pounds. So I love the fact, Lamar, that you – you, you chose to pivot to the backfield for a few years. You dominated that, went back to linebacker. Talk to us a little bit, maybe share a little bit with our listeners of what it was like to play football at such a high level and be recognized at such a young age. Was there pressure? Did you know, hey, I'm going to pound, I'm going to pound the rock and keep playing through college and maybe the NFL. When did that start to become clear for you? I mean, it was it was never any pressure. It was always fun from the start. Always, whenever I played football, it was fun. Yeah. I never looked at it as a job. I never looked at it as like I'm going out here competing with this person. I've always competed with myself. Mm-hmm. You know, so when I got to ninth grade, which I got to sack in a high, yeah. there was a player named Charles Rogers there. Uh, Charles Rogers was <laughs> drafted by the Detroit Lions <laughs> at number two pick, but Charles Rogers was the number one player in the country. You know, and I had an opportunity to watch Chuck um, – bring all of these college um, coaches to the building. I typed in his name on Yahoo at the time, Charles Rogers, number one player in the country. He had his jersey retired. He had an opportunity to pick any school he wanted to go to. And I said, man, I want that. Like, I want that. Like, I love, like, that notoriety he was getting for balling out there on the field. And I had been watching him growing up. But then I had an opportunity to play with him that one year because I was a freshman on varsity. And he was a senior, right? And yeah. man, just watching that whole experience, he just paved the way to show us young guys from Saginaw that we can make it to the next level. Yep. And uh, I did everything that he did. Like I, I wasn't number one player in the country, but I was number number two linebacker. 
Um, and I was definitely in the top ten. So I set that mark that uh, that he paved the way on. When so 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 Charles Rogers, who played wide receiver, right, right. And yeah. how many years did he play in the league? Char- I mean, I think uh, I think two or three due to okay. some injuries and some off the field yeah. stuff. Yeah. So 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 Charles Rogers kind of helps to create the vision that like, hey, I can play at a level in Saginaw that gets me to go to any school I want and into the league at some point. Correct. Who who else at that time in your life, whether it was family, coaches, teachers, who else at that time in your life was a big advocate of you pursuing this dream to play at such a high level? Nobody never put pressure on me to play. Hmm. It's just something I enjoy doing. My parents always supported me. Um, whatever I was doing, as long as it was positive. So they didn't yeah. force sports up on me. They didn't, my dad didn't force me to work out. It wasn't that. He and allowed me, and I enjoyed it. And that's why it's always been fun, because I've never been pushed by anybody mm-hmm. to to want to do it. Now, when I decided to do it, they're going to add on to help. All right, here goes a weight bench, but we ain't going to make you go in there and lift, like take advantage of those type of things. But um, I, <laughs> no, but I, was a, I was a WWE fan, man, WWF <laughs> fan, WCW, like – Hell, that's what I wanted. That's what I wanted to do. <laughs> like before Charles Rogers like showed that, I didn't watch Monday Night Football. I wasn't even though I was a Jerome Bettis fan, I didn't watch all the games. Yeah. On Mondays was WCW and WWF. That was I'm watching that. Hulk Hogan, NWO. Uh, you know, <laughs> that's what I'm watching. And I love that you say that because I had Taiwan Jones here last week. You know, Taiwan played at Michigan State and, you know, had, had a had a, a couple years in the league. And he was talking about when when he wasn't getting picked up after his second season, he went and tried out yeah. for professional wrestling. Yeah. And he went to one tryout and he said, hell no, I am not doing that. No, you know what? <laughs> I thought about it after I finished up. Um, But when you look at what they do now, it's it's a different business now. They're actually down there in Orlando, Florida. They're actually at the WWF. WWE facility yeah, now. Right. Um, so they're doing a lot of training. It's it's more strict than it was back in the day. You could train anywhere. Yeah, you know, that's right. I talked to a couple of pro just wrestlers. Show up to too. The yeah. Show. <laughs> yeah, you can't just do that no more. <laughs> and the money different now too, because he bought out WCW, so there's no competition now. That's right. You got a few that's trying to get into sure. it, but you know sure. sure. You know, the big dollars is usually in the big notoriety at WWE. Yeah. Yeah. So uh so let let's keep moving along the timeline. All right. University of Michigan. Yeah. Now we were just together at dinner a month ago. There's a bunch of Spartans at dinner. Right. And you're cracking jokes about how you love visiting Michigan State, but you wanted to go play at Michigan. What was the difference when you're coming through high school? Because you could have easily ended up in East Lansing. Right. I mean, the biggest difference is um, we had a lot of uh, people from Saginaw on that, at Michigan State at that time. Yeah. Saginaw people, a lot of Flint guys. Yeah, we knew a lot right. of those guys because we was right there. And uh, Charles Rogers was at Michigan State as well, you know. So I was always at Michigan State. I was recruited by Michigan State early on as a freshman. So I was always going down there, even on unofficial visit. Um, and Michigan kind of came in, you know, my sophomore, junior, my sophomore year, my junior year. Um, I started going to some Michigan games, and so Michigan and Michigan State was recruiting me heavy. But you know, I had an opportunity to go anywhere I wanted to go. And uh, Coach Fred Jackson at Michigan, um, who recruited me, who was a running back coach who's there now, uh, he did a great job of recruiting me. Um, because when I was at Michigan and I went on Michigan visits, Michigan's talked about academics. Michigan talked about graduating in four years. Michigan talked about, you know, having access to the alumni there. And for me, that was important mm-hmm. because I knew at any given time I can get hurt and mm-hmm. my career be over with. You know, I don't care what type of top player you are, your career can be over with at any given time. So hearing those words and hearing Coach Carr say, we'll always guarantee your scholarship even if you get hurt, that was big to me, you know. So I was thinking, but I was already at a young age thinking about life after the game if it don't work out for me. Because even though I know how good I am and how talented I am, I understand that one play can end your career. So you got to kind of have that backup plan. Yeah, and I want to – I do want to unpack in a few minutes. I want to hit a couple more things going from college to the pros before we – pivot into media and filmmaking and this incredible <laughs> career that you're you're embarking on yeah. in that space, right? And launching Area 56 Entertainment. I want to talk about that. And I want to I want to make sure we come back to that in a minute because I didn't know that that was already kind of a part of your vision at such a young age, right? You were yeah. you, you already had those things on your mind. So you pick 
University of Michigan. And I forgot, I don't know why I'm not thinking about it. I forgot you played under Coach Carr. Yeah. I mean, that, that <laughs> had to have been incredible. I mean, share, share one of your favorite memories or stories learning under Coach Carr's presence and leadership. I mean, I think it was, uh, it was the, the whole leadership of the University of Michigan, you know, with Coach Carr and the tradition that we had. You know, when, when I got to the University of Michigan, it was about really the team, the team, the team, like Bo said. 100%. And, you know, when we went to team dinners uh, the night before the game, we wore a coat and tie. You know, we wore a coat and tie in the meeting, we wore a coat and tie at dinner, breakfast that morning, to the game, and after the game. Coach Carr didn't want you wearing earrings. If you had a beard or a mustache, make sure it's clean and nice looking. Um, so it taught you how to be men. You know, because when you're that young and you're going to a school, when you're going to a school, you can't just be a football player. You got to be a student athlete because you're only mm -hmm. going to be here for four years. And it's got to be life after the game. And I think Coach Carr and his staff and everybody did a great job, if you listened and paid attention, <laughs> to uh, really be professional young men. Um, and that's what I learned underneath Coach Carr um, is really being a, a professional athlete, learning how to. Uh, conduct yourself um, when you go to. I remember we always do interviews. I didn't. I stopped doing it, but you. He didn't. He didn't want us doing an interview without a collar shirt on, no t-shirt. You know. So that was when you look back on it. And when I got to the NFL, I'm like, damn. He was teaching us how to be men. You know. So you you're prepared different when you come out there. The Michigan players was prepared different. I know for myself. You know, and not being cocky or nothing because sometimes people say that. Michigan players are cocky. If people come from Michigan, it's cocky. It's just like, no, it's a different tradition and that the way that they um, brought us up as athletes. So I have heard, I'm, I'm glad you said that. There's a couple of things you said that really resonate for me because I've heard this from others. Coach Carr and the coaches would say, you can't just come here and be a football player. You've got to come here to be a student athlete. Right. Um, I also heard you reinforce the team, the team, the team. And that's one of those, when you spoke about the coat and tie, the coat and tie, the coat and tie, I've heard other guys express so much gratitude over that, yeah. over what it meant to look like a professional on the first impression. Right. Yeah. And you know, times has definitely changed now. You know, everybody's not wearing a coat and tie like sure. they used to, but at that time it was important because you got young men, we're from everywhere. I'm from Saginaw, you got people from California, Florida, Ohio. And, you know, we're still young men looking for a way, yeah, um, growing right. into men. That's right. And I think Coach Carr and his staff and everybody did a great job of doing that, uh, a great job of doing that. Um, so, yeah. So you had an incredible career at Michigan, right? Unbelievable I'm, career. Yeah, I mean, let me, let me, let, yeah, let me. Let, <laughs> hey, I don't talk about it as much, though. No, I, look. I, I really don't. I really stay humble about, like, the stuff I've done. <laughs> I do. Look. And I said today I was going to talk a little bit about it because I've done so. I, I've really, think about it, to be, uh, to be a professional athlete, a football player, and play at the highest level at every level and, and sit at the top down there at every level from high school college and in the pros and have records in high school, college and pros, you know, that's, that's huge. Like, and don't get me wrong. And I always say this, I don't accomplish any of those things without my teammates. I have a great teammates. I had great teammates. I had people that um, necessarily, they don't get the credit, but they helped me ball out. Cause there's no one person that get on any one team and ball out because in football, they can ice you out the game. 100%. Run the other way. Yeah, 100%. But when you play with other good people on the team, <laughs> it allows your talent to showcase even more. You know, and that's the yeah. thing of team. When you got a good group of guys on your team, your talent will shine. Yes. And that's why we had the success at Saginaw High, at Michigan, and at Pittsburgh. We had a great group of guys that they can't focus on one guy. It's like, who the hell do we block? Yeah. Because all of those guys are like good. And they all got that killer mentality when they're about to attack you. You know, so that's why I was able to get all those awards. <laughs> but my teammates know, like, I always tell them, and I appreciate them. Like, when I go to Dave Harris' house, I'm like, every time I walk in this house, man, I love this house. Like, this was my boy. Like, we bought out together. Yes. He didn't get those awards, but he was a key factor on me getting those awards. So I always appreciate guys that grind with me and help me get to where I was at in my career. Because I couldn't have done it without none of them guys. Okay, so 
I love, I, I mean, I'm absolutely obsessed about the fact that all I hear you say is team T. I mean, you've said team like 71 times. We've been on for 10 minutes. <laughs> I love that. But look, I, I, like when you kind of tease, like, yeah, you know, I'm going to actually talk about it today. I'm glad you are. Let me go through a list of a few that I took down. Okay. Top two linebacker in the country heading off to college goes to one of the most dominating programs of all time in college football history, unanimous All-American, Lombardi Award, Ted Hendricks Award, Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year, First Team All Big Ten, Big Ten Defensive Lineman of the Year, Defensive MVP <laughs> of the 2005 Rose Bowl. Yeah. <laughs> And I yeah. left stuff out because yeah. I got tired. And I was the team captain, one of the team captains at Michigan. That's <laughs> <laughs> hey, I was the first player, you know, uh, Hutchison broke my record. And when he broke the record, I was watching the Michigan-Ohio State game. And they're like, Hutchison just set the record. And I'm like, do I have the record at Michigan? I forgot I had the sack record at Michigan. No. You know, so when he broke that record, I was happy for him because yes. I, I've trained at the same gym I seen him train at in the summertime. And people are like, man, how you feel? I'm like, what do you mean how I feel? It's a record. Like, what, you expect the record to stay up there forever? Somebody has to break the record. You know, somebody has to break the record, and you always root for your guys. That was a dumb question somebody asked. What do you think about the him it, breaking they, your record? They are. They are. What? When people ask, yeah. It's right, a record. Come like, Come on. You, yeah. when, when you was there small, small minded folks, yeah, so. you, you was there you, you did what you had to do that was it somebody gonna come break your record and move you out the way that's what's supposed to happen I want to give a special shout out to my friend Dana Cornelius Dana's the CEO co-owner of Sporta Kings the, the gear that I am rocking today yes folks I do wear more than a blue suit white shirt and a tie check out their website S-O-K-F-Y dot com if you drop in the word podium in the discount code, they're going to send you an amazing, amazing, amazing package of whatever you order with 20% off. Check it out. Sport of Kings. Love Dana and Tiffany. So, hey, I want to go back, though. I also want to recognize the fact that you say, hey, I never talk about it. And I, I need to, like, call facts on that. That's fact. Because we've spoken a bunch of times since our children started going to school together. Right. Over at least the last course of the last year, year and a half. All right. And we've never, ever, outside of you, Benny, and Connor Cruz and them jabbing at dinner one time right. about football, you've never talked about it. Nah. Never. I, I don't really I don't really talk about it as much. It's like, you know, that chapter is over with. You know? <laughs> unless unless somebody started talking football and it's like yeah, then let's talk about it. You know, if any high yeah. school dudes or anything like, oh, man, you probably wasn't that good. I ain't got to talk. All you got to do is type it up, and you're going to see it. I don't even got to say much. People are just like, hey, Manny, who's your quiet, big-ass friend? <laughs> no, I think, you know, I was, I was at, I was at uh, the dinner. It was a bunch of Michigan State guys. I had watched, uh, I had watched, what's Paul's last name? Paul, Davis. Paul Davis, yeah. when, you David know, Thomas. when he was at Michigan State. Yeah. Um, Benny, when he was in high school, he was training at the same facility. And I used to always just see Benny anyways, just because I mentored Draymond when he was in high school. So, mm -hmm. you know, when Draymond Green, I mentored mm -hmm. Draymond. So I was always at Michigan State. So, you know, we had a bunch of guys that came through Michigan State. And when you, you know, you working with, you working with guys and guys from your hometown, you root for them no matter what. Yeah. I always root for my guys. You know what I'm saying? Whether it's a rivalry or not, because to That's me, right. it's bigger than a rival. When you're an athlete, you understand that these guys going out there working hard every mm -hmm. day, definitely in college. You know, they got to be a student athlete. Mm -hmm. You know, so when I see one of my guys from Saginaw playing at Michigan State or playing at any rivalry school, I'm going to mm -hmm. root for them because I want to see them do good because I know the work that they putting in to get to that level. Yeah, you I, know? Lo I love that. I love that. And I heard. I wasn't there, but I heard from like Benny and Paul Davis and David Thomas and the guys that at Draymond's Hall of Fame moment last week, he recognized like he's like like standing on the shoulder of giants, right? How many right. people poured into him right. throughout his life Correct. to help him achieve what he's achieved. And right. he's so young. He just, I mean, you guys are right. just getting started. All you guys are so young. Right. You're just getting started. I'm the dinosaur when we're together. And then even, even with that, it's always a thing of like reaching back, helping all the other people. Yeah. You know, that was one thing when, when I was coming up, uh, one of the guys I used to always talk to and 
I always stopped there when I was in college was Mateen Cleese, another oh, Michigan State dude. guy. Mateen's you know, Mateen, coming out in a couple of weeks. And, and Mateen is always a guy that's like talking positive, giving yes. back to where you're from yep. and making sure that you reach back out to the younger guys behind you because you know that they're going to be going through the same stuff that you're going through. You know, so that was just one of the things that I did for Draymond. Like, you know, here I am, a top player. Draymond at the time wasn't even, he was just Draymond Green. Yeah. He, he, he was in the, he yeah. was a ninth grade. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, mentoring him and making sure you're just giving them information and trying to guide them the right way. You know what I'm saying? Because understanding that they're going to go down the same path or similar path that you go through and you go, you're trying to be there to make sure that they don't make the same mistakes that you made. Mm -hmm. Were you able to give them certain advice on certain things? Mm -hmm. Because uh, when I was going, mm -hmm. there was nobody, there was, I wouldn't say nobody... I had I had people later on in my career, like when I got to Michigan, mm -hmm. you know, like a Sam Sword, mm -hmm. um, who was a linebacker at yep. Michigan. He pulled yep. me underneath his wing. So, and one of his things that he always talked about, just like Mateen Cleaves, is, Wood, when I'm giving you this knowledge and this information, make sure that you go back and you pass that on. So that's always been my thing. Like whenever I get some knowledge and information, yes. I'm always passing it on, trying to pull the next person up. Now, some people want to take it, some people don't. But, like, that's what they told me to do, so I make sure that I do that because mm -hmm. now we're able to pull more people out where we're from sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. Let's uh, let's do a little bit of rapid fire on University of Michigan. I want to pivot to the pros. Uni your, your, your days at the University of Michigan, of all the – I mean, I read off with 10-plus accolades, and there's more that I did not list all right. because <laughs> I, our team truly got tired of doing due diligence on you. What was your greatest achievement? The thing you look back on still and you're like, man, when I got that, that that was special to me. Man, when I became the team captain. Yeah, love that. Because these are guys that you grind with for the last three or four years. And some guys are fifth year seniors. And here I am my fourth year and I got voted team captain. That means that they trusted me to go out here and lead this team and lead them. Mm -hmm. And that year, that's exactly what I did. Mm -hmm. um, that was one of our best years ever. I do go back and you ask anybody on that team, and they're going to say, man, Wood we'll changed that team when, when he went out there and led because I mm -hmm. sat there and I watched for three years on how people led before me, what was missing, what we need to do around here. And I said, man, if they ever vote me team captain, mm -hmm. I'm going to change this shit up. <laughs> yeah. Talk, 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 uh, let's, um, let's unpack that a little bit. Right. What are one or two things that you said, hey, if I become team captain when I do, these are things I will do differently. Give us examples of one or two things those were. Oh, uh, man, I always felt like our bus ride was too quiet going to the game. Mm -hmm. I, we was professional. We had our ties mm -hmm. and we had our suit on, you know. Mm -hmm. We was too quiet. It was too quiet in the locker room. We get on the field and we break down. It was too quiet. I'm like, man, we got to change this up. Mm -hmm. You know, we started to chant on the bus. We started mm -hmm. to chant in the locker room. And you would think that we would already be doing that because we Michigan, but we wasn't. But we started doing that. You know, I uh, uh, that that year, I went in and I uh, I told Coach Carr, we we're looking for a defensive coordinator, and I told Coach Carr, hey, we ain't got to look for no D coordinator. He said, why? I said, everybody love Ron English. Now, I ain't saying I got Coach English hired, but <laughs> a couple weeks later, wow, he was hired. Wow, and I knew that every guy on that T defense loved Coach E and Coach D, Coach D. Coach E had that mentality of a player, like get after, wow. get after people. Yeah. And I love that mentality. And I went in there and I told Coach, Coach Cardat, and uh, we had Coach E, and that's one of the best years we had because he understood us as players. He was aggressive. He didn't sit back and we get attacked. Like he was about listening to the players, and they voted the right person to captain because I'm a team player. If we got an issue and the players feel a certain way, I'm going to talk to Coach Carr. Yeah. You know, that was my thing. If Coach Carr asked me about something on the team, I don't know nothing. I wasn't one of them captains. I'm going to be the police for you. Mm -hmm. I'm one of those captains to make sure that every guy on this team understand their role. We're playing together. And I used to have this saying when I used to break down the defense, which was something else different that I always did. Um, so on, on Fridays, you give a speech to the defense, like, uh, before you leave out. Yeah. Before we, before we break. Sure. And I'm like, what the hell am I going to say? I used to sit in there and be like, what the hell is the team captain going to say every year? And then I'm like, what am I going to say? Now I'm the team captain. And I'm like, man, you got to be honest with guys in this room. Mm -hmm. We know we're here for. I used to talk and I said, we, we, y'all know we're here for. We're going to get this ring, this trophy, and then that money. <laughs> 
that's what we was playing for. Guys was playing because of every guy dreamed of going to the NFL. So why are we talking about anything else besides the Dude, ring, thanks. the trophy, and the money? Because once right. we go out there and do that as a team, we all eat. Yeah. We When we win, we all eat. Whether your stats are here and you that's win right. the awards to the person not in winning the awards, right. we all eat. And that's what happened on that team. Probably about eight or nine guys got drafted off that defense. And winning teams get more guys drafted. Period. Correct. Just yep. period, point blank. It's yep. statistically proven. Yep. Yeah, I love that you were already unpacking that and saying, like, dude, this is fact. And so that's all we got to deal with. That's all we got to be about. And being a captain, you understand you can't lead by yourself. I knew I couldn't lead the whole defense because even though I had a relationship with everybody on the defense, I wasn't in everybody's defensive room. Yeah. So any good captain knows to a point people in certain rooms. We got the line, we got somebody in the linebacker room. I got the defensive room. Here's the guy in the secondary. Lead the old guys. And when we come out here on Saturday, we gonna jail together, and that's what we did. We Love jailed it. together and we had fun. Who was the hardest hitter you played with at the University of Michigan in any one of your four years? Hardest hitter, Dave Harris. Dave, Dave Harris. Harris. Dave Harris, linebacker that went on to play for the Jets for all those years. Dave Harris, hard hitting guy, hard hitting guy, smart. You know, and that's why he did so good in the NFL. Yeah, smart guy. Dave would have been one of the top players too if he didn't have so many injuries when he was at Michigan. Who was? The greatest teammate during your time at University of Michigan. And, and tell us a little bit about that. The greatest yeah, teammate. Yeah, the greatest teammate. Like, this is what being a great teammate looks like. Who was that? I can't really say. Is there anybody that you looked at that you said, man, I really love having him as a teammate? And was there something specific that stood out about them that was your guy? Man, I used to love watching Jason Avant. Huh. Receiver. Yeah. I think Jason yeah. Avant. Man, he worked so hard every single day that when he got in the game, he made it look easy. I yeah, enjoyed sure. Jason Avant. And then I enjoyed really Mike Hart. Mike Hart. Mike Hart wasn't the fastest dude, but he was a dog. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He had he had real heart. I I love that about him. So I'll I'll have to say those two guys, I enjoyed watching them play and practice. I love that. So you go into draft day. And and you're you're coming you're gonna be coming out with a show about draft night, draft day. Yeah. 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 You go into yours, and I want to hear about that in a minute, but you go into yours. What were you thinking on that night? What was the most consistent thing you were thinking about that night? Is uh am I going in the first round or second round? Love it. And whatever round I go in and whatever team get me, yeah, I'm gonna do what I did at these last two levels. Yeah, I love it. I'm gonna that. go there, help the team out. And do what Lamar Woodley do. Like, that was my mindset. And, of course, you always want to go in the first round because there's more money in the first round. But then when I went to the second round to the Steelers, I was just like, man, God put me in a great position. I'm not that far away from home. I'm on my favorite team. Oh, my gosh. You know, they they just uh, released Joey Porter. They're known for linebackers. Oh, that's right. Um, so this is a great situation for me. Dude, they're a linebacker factory. Oh, yeah. Are you kidding me? Yeah. When's the last time they didn't have great linebackers? Man, every year. Right? They, they know how to they know how to draft them. And then you you learn why Pittsburgh is so special. So that night, yeah. I wasn't worried. It was special. just about am I going first round or second round? I love it. That's it. I love it. What's what's one of your fondest memories from your time um with Coach Tomlin and the team? Oh, uh, it had to be the Super Bowl. Yeah, can you uh, share about that? So the Super Bowl, uh, I think we were up. I don't even know the score of that game, but um, it was the last possession of the game and the Cardinals had the ball and we were up. And I think if they scored a touchdown, they were going to win. And they were probably on the, I want to say the 50-yard line. You know, of course, they had Larry Fitzgerald. Yeah. Tall receiver, got hands like that, he got glue on there. At, at, peak, of his, <laughs> at peak of his career right. playing then. Uh, Kurt Warner at quarterback. Oh, yeah. And I just remember Coach Tomlin <laughs> Gunslinger. coming to me like, uh, he was like, hey, Wood. I need you to make a big play now. You know, and it's like, all right, coach, I hear you. Like, it's like some movie type shit. The coach comes yes. talk to you like, hey, we need you to make a play. Yeah. You know, it's that last <laughs> second, and you see the car go, do, do, and you see the ball go up. It was like one of those type plays. I'm like, yeah, coach, okay. You know, and I wasn't, I wasn't nervous about it. I, w I wasn't nervous about it. You know, I played in front of big crowds. If yeah. I'm at Michigan, you playing in front of 100,000. That's right. Wrong. It's the Super Bowl. But I had been used to playing in front of big crowds. 
my entire life. Yeah. And when Coach Tomlin said that, I'm like, yeah, Coach, all right, I got you. And so we get out there, and the ball snapped. I remember I'm rushing. I'm going against Levi Brown. You know, we've been kind of going to, going up against each other since he was at Penn State. And Gosh, the thing right. about it, when you're on, when you're a left outside linebacker, the quarterback can see you. Mm-hmm. So when Kurt Warner dropping back, we looking at each other. Mm-hmm. But I'm also have the, Levi Brown in front of me, so I got to defeat him and get to Kurt. So I got to play mind game. Yeah. <laughs> so I rush up the field. <laughs> And I slipped a little bit, but didn't lose my grip. And I still got my eyes on Kirk. And I was able to throw Levi off of me. And I seen Kirk leaning back. And I just kind of like Superman. I had like one hand here and another hand here to like cup the pass. Yeah. If he throw it. And I knocked it out of his hand. And uh, forced a fumble. And uh, Brett Kiesel jumped on the ball. And I remember after the game, he was like, Wood, you want the ball? And I'm like, no, wasn't thinking about, damn, that's the Super Bowl ball. So Brett Keys will end up taking that ball home. And if I ever go to his house, I'm going to steal that ball. <laughs> Guarantee. And you that Super here, Bowl bro. run, I had two sacks in every playoff game. I got 13 sacks in the postseason. I'm like 13 all this in the NFL. What? Well, postseason sacks. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I got, a, I think, 11 and a half or 12. I'm like number 13 or 14 on the all-time list postseason. And I did it in seven games. <laughs> seven games. 11 <laughs> sacks in seven games. <laughs> I got some records. That's what I said. I've already done what I need to do. I got records sitting out there. Uh, I love it. Um, favorite teammate from your time in Pittsburgh? Uh, I mean, my favorite teammate was Ryan Mundy. Because me and Ryan Mundy... Are went- you... We went to Michigan together. Are you serious? Yeah. You know I had Monday on the show. I know Monday from my days in Chicago. Oh, no. Nah. Because he finished in Chicago when yeah. I was still in Chicago. Yeah. Yeah, that's oh. my friend, man. That's my brother right there. Me and Monday, we we all came into Michigan together. And um, I, when I got drafted to Pittsburgh, Monday got drafted the year later to Pittsburgh. So it was just like having my brother on the team. So we hung out every single day. And I tell Monday, too, when Monday left, my career fell off. I think my heart was broken. My friend left. What? <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> my career fell off when Monday left, though. But that's my brother, though, man. So we we had a good time, man. That's yeah, great. Yeah, Ryan Monday. So one of the things I've always heard about the locker room in Pittsburgh is about discipline, habits, leadership, standards. It's a machine. It's It's like the expectations are simple. They're clear. This is what it means to be great. This is what it means to be a stealer. Can you share a little bit about what some of those maybe nuggets were that you saw just pounded day after day after day in the locker room about what it meant to look like to be a leader at the Pittsburgh Steelers? I don't think it was pounded in you every day. I just think how the organization was ran from the top down. Yeah, say you more got, about that. You know, you got Mr. Rooney who's at the facility every day. Mr. Rooney would be in the locker room, the lunch room, come talk to you. His office doors was always open. He walked to the game. He rode the team playing with us. He was a part of the team. So when you see the owner a part of the team and always around and somebody that you can touch and always talk to, it becomes family. Mm -hmm. It becomes family. You see people and players like Mean Joe Green around. Mel Blunt coming around. Mm -hmm. You know, Jason Gild and so... The history was always tied into Pittsburgh. It was always a family. You know, the players, like now I can go back to Pittsburgh anytime I want to. It's a family. It's a, it's a family organization. Mm-hmm. And when you see that and you're a part of it, it's just it's something special. And I think that's what they do. Like they do a good job of making sure everybody in the building knows everybody. We knew the cooks, you know, the janitors, you know, all the secretary. It was a family type atmosphere. And I think. When you have that and you have that tradition and the tradition is always connected. When you look back on like, even when I look back at the Stiller linebackers, like I was there and I'm playing with James Harrison and all these other linebackers. Man. They had, they, they played with Joey Porter. Joey Porter done played with Jason Gilden and Levon, mm. and Jason Gilden done played with LeVon Kirkland. Mm-hmm. It goes back to uh, Kevin Green and uh, Greg Lloyd. So it's always been somebody was connected to that history. I kind of looked at that myself and it's always, so it's passed on. So you understand the mentality of the Pittsburgh still a defense. Like 
and the team. And when we went to play on the road, I'll be looking at film the week before. The team we playing ain't got nobody in the crowd. Whenever Steelers came in town, yeah. we never had an empty stadium. Uh, we sure. the, the team always, yeah. any team we played, wanted to play their best against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Yep. So we had a fight every single game. Mm-hmm. You know, so we played tough games. All the, Nobody laid down for the Steelers because it was like, we finna see how we match up against them. You finally hung it up in 2015? Yeah. Walk us through what that decision-making process looked like. Like, when did you know? What was it that was happening that told you, hey, it's time to move on to this other dream I have? It wasn't fun no more. And one of the reasons that it wasn't fun, I went and I said this a while back ago, was I, my last year I played with the Arizona Cardinals. Mm-hmm. And the defensive coordinator there was just a terrible guy. He didn't mm. know nothing about football. Mm. He was one of those guys who really got into position and wanted to see could he make something work. And he didn't have to make it work. It was already built. Probably one of the dumbest defensive coordinators I played for, and that's why he's probably not in the league now. He went on to coach in New York, screwed up their defensive team. <laughs> they got rid of him. He was terrible. <laughs> he, he wasn't. I, I come from the Pittsburgh Steelers, man. When mm-hmm. you come from an organization like that and you see a defensive coordinator like Dick LeBeau rallying, this is a Hall of Fame coach. Yeah. Super Bowl winning oh, coach. Yeah. For, yeah. A, a super a, a top player when he played in the yeah. league. That's right. From Ohio State. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So when you got somebody like Dick LeBeau and you see how he can rally up the guys and get us to win and play, and then you go to another D coordinator who ain't got nothing and watch him screw a team up, we should have went to the Super Bowl that year when I played with the Cardinals. We should have beat Carolina in the NFC Championship game, but we didn't because you got coaches like that can't make adjustments. But study was getting the opportunity. It was terrible. I shouldn't have said nothing about it. I should have. He was terrible. <laughs> He was terrible, man. But <laughs> what I had a chance to see, yeah, this is going to be good. Terrible. The thing is, <laughs> you get a chance to see, like, how the hell is this dude coaching? <laughs> and getting paid what he was getting, getting paid. paid. <laughs> I've nobody liked him. Uh, I've never seen a team where so many guys didn't like him. Oh. Uh, he was the discussion <laughs> every time on the bus down there, like, man, he calling this. Just panic. <laughs> panic you should have just gone straight lord of the flies anarchy on it called yeah, your own <laughs> made football man it was like man this is how football is oh man like you got guys i've never even talked to him but it seemed like he had a chip on his shoulder yeah you know because sometimes what ended up happening is here i am coming to arizona now he got his guy that he wanted to play linebacker yeah that's right why but are you when here he, when he get overruled <laughs> and yeah. then bruce Aronson bring lamar woodley in yeah he rooting for his guy to yeah, win the job. That's right. And when I win the job, now I'm in hell all week because it's like this. Yeah. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Yeah. So now I got to deal know. with him all year because uh, now he get that final say so when I'm on the field or not. That's right. Yeah, terrible. Oh, terrible man. rookie coordinator. His name uh James Betchen or Butcher, whatever his <laughs> name is. He probably ain't got a <laughs> job. Terrible. Go, go look. <laughs> Go look when he came to the coordinator for the New York Giants and watch how he destroyed. Oh, my goodness. Do you hear me? Destroyed that team. <laughs> they got his ass up out of there. I knew it was terrible in Arizona. <laughs> terrible coach. Oh, we're if you, if, you, no. if you bring him on your defensive staff, he going to f*** up your whole team. Guaranteed. No. no. Don't do it. High school. Don't even do middle school. Terrible coach. No. Hey, coach. He don't know how to work with his coaches. He don't know how to work with his players. <laughs> terrible coach. <laughs> terrible. I'm done with it. He terrible. He know he terrible. And any guy that played on the Cardinals team know he terrible too. And anybody that played with New York, I wasn't even there. They know he <laughs> terrible. Ava and Atlas, look, now you know. I ain't even mad. It's now, funny. Now you know that dad is not the only one who says that's terrible. Terrible, man. <laughs> Lamar. You need to, when you see Ava and Atlas at school, you need to be like, hey, that was terrible, right? Terrible. Because they tease every time that they know I don't like something, they just want to ask me, hey, so what do you think that? Because I'll just be like, that's terrible. That's terrible. I, they just want to hear me say yeah. it's terrible. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about something that's not terrible. Let's talk about the fact that early on in your life, you were already starting to dream and think about filmmaking, yeah. media, camera, lights, action. 
and you founded Area 56 Entertainment. Right. Share a little bit about your vision for that. How long ago you really started working towards that? And tell us about the studio in Detroit. Well, I started, I, I really started um, getting involved with it probably my first year in, uh, in the NFL. I would always do a radio show, TV show. I would always do something to stay active, already thinking about life after the game. So I'm training yep. myself already. Um, so one year I just decided I'm tired of these radio stations and TV stations telling me what the hell I can do on air. I can't show who I am. Guess what? I can hire my own crew. I hired my own crew. I did an opening for the show. I had my brother create a song for the opening of the show. Um, I produced the opening intro video, and it was called The Lamar Woodley Show. And The Lamar Woodley Show, every week I took it to a different location because I wanted to highlight different areas in Pittsburgh that wasn't Love getting it. any attention. So I went to the Pee Wee Football League. I went to the, the fire station. I went to the Veteran Memorial uh, Hospital. I went to the lady house who got a restaurant. I would highlight people in the area by using who I am. And just all I got to do is cut the camera on them for a minute and they might get some business. So that's how I thought about it. And I'm doing the show that I get to do. There was yes. no pressure on what to say or what to do. Yeah. I'm doing a recap of the game before on the way I want to do it. Yeah. Now, I never pushed the show. It was just fun. Yeah. I had some fun with it. And that's when I first started and I realized, oh, I can do this. I can do this a little bit, you I know. I love it. And so I started doing more and more stuff after that. I love it. One of the one of the things we've spoken about recently is money and problems. Yeah. Tell yeah. Us, share share a little bit with our listeners about that. Uh I wrote this movie, uh, me and a girl named Kim Owens. We wrote a movie called Money and Problems. Um, it's not it's a comedy movie. It's about some magical edibles. Uh, <laughs> two brothers. Uh, <laughs> Gino and Rogers. Um, what ended up happening is they got into a little, got into some, some money problems, and they end up um, getting some money from their uncle. And uh, he came back looking for their money, looking for his money, and they end up finding some magical cookies from a local drug dealer, and uh, they went on their journey. So it's a comedy movie called Money and Problems. It's on Amazon Prime, starring. Uh, Ron Taylor and Josh Adams. Josh Adams, if y'all don't know, if you watched Hard Knock with the Lions, he was the comedian on there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Josh Adams is uh, starring in that, that movie. So Amazon Prime, y'all check it out. I wrote it, uh, helped write it. Um, I edited the movie. Uh, so yeah, this is my first one. I had, I had some fun with it. First movie, and it's not terrible. Shit, it I don't know. That's <laughs> on you to judge it. Uh, it's my first movie. I take, you know, if you want to sell me something good, bad, whatever, I take anything. Just check it out. Let me know what you think. You ain't going to break my heart. It's my first movie. Hey, when we were at dinner a couple of weeks ago, you talked about Spank Horton. Mm -hmm. I couldn't even believe it. We were together a couple of weeks before that. You didn't mention nothing. And then all of a sudden, a couple of weeks later, you're like, yeah, I was at this place, struck up this agreement, and I started filming this new show. Tell, tell our listeners yeah, about so, that. Yeah, so Spank Horton um, is with Kevin Hart, Plastic Cup Boys. He's a stand-up comedian. And I actually met Spank and Kevin Hart and them back in like 2009. I met them at the Kevin Hart was doing an improv in Detroit. Um, I mean, in Pittsburgh when I met them. So they ended up coming to my home, uh, home city of Saginaw. So they was there. I was back there with Kevin and, uh, you know, Spank. And then we just having a good time. And after the show, I took them out in Saginaw. So it was me and the plastic <laughs> cup. We got no security. I got Kevin Hart and them at the open mic night. Uh, so I've always kept in contact with Spank just over those years. And I was flying out to L.A. on a, to go to a, a meeting, actually, and I seen Spank sitting down. I love it. And I said, hey, Spank, what's up, man? He's like, oh, Lamar, what's going on? I'm like, man, what, what you got up? Where you going? He's like, man, I'm finna fly out to L.A. I'm like, all right, cool. I said, well, I'm going to get on the plane because they take that overhead space fast, even in first class. I yeah. got to get one of those spaces. Yeah. So Spank ended up getting on the plane, and so he was sitting. we were sitting right across from each other in the aisle. I love it. And... We end up talking, and I he he asked me was I still doing my film stuff. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, what you got up? And he's saying, uh, where well, I'm doing my my tour now. Outside of me touring with Kevin, uh, I'm doing a tour. I got a five seven city tour. I'm like, okay. I'm like, man, let me film it. I got my production crew. Let me film it. I'm sending him trailers on stuff that I've done. He like, it. bet, let's do it. So the following week, we end up doing his Detroit show, Cleveland. Then we did all of his Texas shows, and then we got one more in Philly. That's so we awesome. So I ended up putting that together with my crew. <laughs> um, you know, it's an opportunity. 
I love you know, that. I still look at it as an opportunity. You know, Spank has been in this game for a while, and it's an opportunity. So you got to bet on yourself. So me hiring my crew saying, I believe that I can do this. I know I can do it. I know I can make this happen. Yeah, and you know what? It's interesting you said that, right? Because these simple lessons are so relevant to anyone in life. Like, you got to believe in yourself. Yep. You got to be willing to take the risk and bet on yourself. And you got to ask for the business. Yep. I mean, because you asked for it. Yeah. Right? It's not like Spank said, hey, come film me. Right. And so where are people going to be able to find that? Well, no, we're still filming it right now. Oh, yeah, you got Philly we, left still. Yeah, we still got Philly left. Um, the goal is uh, we're going to start pitching it after we uh, get everything edited, get all the story and get everything together because we still have a lot to shoot. Mm -hmm. So we're not just filming the the show. It's yeah. not a BTS. So when we yeah. go to Philly, we're going to be meeting with people that he know, going yeah. back you know, back to his hometown. So it's a lot of stuff that's, that's still involved with that. And like I said, though, you got to bet on yourself. Got to bet on yourself. You got you to gotta bet on yourself. Got to bet on yourself. Yeah. So tell me before, because we're running out of time, and tell me before we wrap up, what's the project you're most excited about right now as you look forward? Man, I, I'm, I'm actually, I'm excited about all my projects. Okay. I'm excited about them because I was able to get in this film space. I used to do a lot of community work coming out. Yeah. Always, you go back, I did a lot of stuff in Saginaw. I've done stuff here in Detroit, Pittsburgh. Yep. And this film stuff still give me an opportunity to help people. I get to hire people. I give the. I have an opportunity to give people a job in acting yeah. to showcase their talent that they can't go to Hollywood and get some time. And there's a lot of good filmmakers here in the city of Detroit. And here in Metro Detroit, I'm just one of them. That's right. But to be able to hire people and give mm -hmm. them an opportunity to showcase mm -hmm. their talent, man, I get a kick out of that. So mm -hmm. any project that that I'm involved with, mm -hmm. I'm happy about it because we all get to work. It's, yeah. You know, I'm putting up the money, but we're working as a team. And I tell them that to make this successful. Yeah. We all got to play our part to really make this successful. And and that's what I look forward to. And even my new project that you were asking about, Draft Day, um, I'm looking forward to that because I started that project a couple of years ago. And I'm just going to really get on it because I think it's important that people understand what athletes really go through. That's right. When they eventually get money. That's right. You know, and it's not just the fast cars and the partying. There's a lot of different things that go on with people that scam you out of money, family members taking advantage of you. Just people really see you as a target. And I was one of those guys that's been taken advantage of by people close to me, by people not so close to me. Sure. You get what I'm saying? But yeah. I, I 100%. think sometimes we get taken advantage of because we don't talk about it. Somebody mm -hmm. will rob you and you don't say, hey, man, they robbed me over there because you're embarrassed right. about it. But no, I think sometimes you got you, you to gotta put that stuff out there and make people aware of that so it don't continuously happen to yeah. the athletes. Yeah, I mean, I've heard that before from other you know mutual friends of ours and, and friends of mine that have played in the league. It's like when they've had those moments, like, man, if they had just had, had a little bit more awareness they might not have made the same decisions, right? So right. it sounds like there's going to be a lot of opportunity for empowering these young men and women who come into these incredible opportunities by going professional to ensure that that awareness and that education is there to help them understand, hey, what, what if it doesn't feel good, it's probably not good. Right. 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 You know, because everybody come to you with these. Uh, <laughs> can't miss opportunities. Can't miss guaranteed <laughs> opportunity. They look, they look right. They dress them right. Uh, nice play. They might have it. I was set up one time by another athlete. Another athlete recommend this guy that took advantage of me. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, that's right. So you 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 run into things like that where you got other people vouching for other people, and they know that that person a bad person, and they set you up. You get what I'm saying? So you take hits, but luckily you, I didn't take no hits where it affected my life. It was just a hit that was a learning experience, and it really yes. taught me. So just even yeah. moving forward and. In film, I understand that now. Because yeah. we all, when you a businessman, you got to go through some hits. That's right. You got to go oh, through 100%. some hits. You got to go through yep. some losses. Yep. And it's all about how did you learn from those losses? How did you learn from those hits so you don't make those same mistakes again as you mm -hmm. continue to grow? I just mm -hmm. got mine early on in life. Some people get them on later in life, yeah. but I got mine early. And it, and it goes back goes back to a basic principle of audit your circles, right? Yep. Audit your circles. Audit them often, man. Yep, 100%. So we've got to agree before we end right now. One of the projects we need to film in the coming weeks is a Den of Thieves-like garage scene before Detroit Country Day's homecoming. Because when the <laughs> girls, when our girls go to homecoming, I want to make sure we pull these boys into a garage and make sure that we set the tone and the standard for what time is curfew and what's appropriate. <laughs> Agreed? Hey, when I first seen you, what did I tell you? I pulled you to the side. <laughs> 
we're at eight. I said, Manny. I said, come in. <laughs> hey, hey, we got to get together, man. We we blind right now. Um, we ain't got no true. communications. Kids going to high school. We blind, man. We got to get together. We got to be on the same page. That's it. So we're going to film that. Gang, look, this was an incredible conversation. By far, not terrible with my man, Lamar Woodley. I mean, seriously, one of the most decorated, one of the most decorated collegiate linebackers hailing out of the University of Michigan, one of the greatest programs of all time. I have to be respectful. And Pittsburgh, that. too. I'm and, on them records, too. And then going. Probably number 10 or 11 on all-time still is a sack list. And then going to my second favorite NFL team, the one and only Pittsburgh Steelers. He's now the CEO of Area 56 Entertainment. And we're going to see incredible things coming out from Lamar Woodley. Um, movies, uh, comedy, short films. I can't wait to see all the awesome things you yeah, do, Yeah, go brother. to my Instagram. It's area56ENT. Check us out. Um, follow us. If you're looking to get into some acting, DM us. That's We're it. always looking for new talent, definitely here in Michigan. I think we got a huge pool of talent around the whole state. Yep. Just don't get that many opportunities. So, man, that's let it. us know. Yeah. Even pitch some ideas. I'm all, that's, why I call you, that's why I call it Area 56, like Area 51. You don't know what's behind those gates. I'm always curating some. That's it. I just create sometimes. Hey, man, I'm glad you were with <laughs> us. Appreciate you. Appreciate you, man. Thank you. Folks, thanks so much for listening, and thank you to our guest, Lamar Woodley. For more information on Lamar, you can follow him at Lamar Woodley on Instagram and check out Area 56 Entertainment, and that's at Area 56 ENT. If you like what you heard today, please be sure to follow, rate, and review at the podium on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Post about the so show on social media and tag us. We'll repost to share our gratitude. Also, consider telling a friend about the show. Friend to friend remains the best way to get the word out about our podcasts and these conversations. <laughs>